This program is supported by the Calliopeia Foundation. Calliopeia honors all life as sacred and works to heal global issues at their root causes. The projects they support hold a common vision for a future built on love, reverence, and responsibility for our shared home. Their visionary generosity brings impactful projects to life. Hey for the Wild listeners, Ayana here. I'd like to take a moment to thank the city of Bend, Oregon. As we near the winter solstice, I'm looking forward to honoring the many gifts these cold months bring us, including vast snow-covered landscapes and new opportunities for adventure. If you're like me, you enjoy visiting places that respect Earth and all its offerings. Bend is known for its incredible mountain adventures like skiing and snowboarding on Mount Bachelor, or snowshoeing across Newberry Caldera. Bend, Oregon is a member of Pledge for the Wild, a group of mountain towns that support responsible tourism by encouraging visitors to give back to local organizations that are tending to these wild places year-round. If you're looking for a winter getaway, consider visiting Bend, Oregon, and help preserve Bend's winter splendor by giving back at PledgeWildBend.com. That's PledgeWildBend.com. Welcome to For the Wild Podcast, in the field edition. I'm Ayana Young. This is the first episode of In the Field, a new bioregional, place-based storytelling series that For the Wild has been co-creating for the past four years. I began working on this series back in 2016, during my first trip to Prince of Wales Island in southeast Alaska. I had gone up with my dear ally, Jade Begay, along with a coven of women that I had barely known for a month, intent on bearing witness to ground zero of old-growth logging on this island that has more roads than any other in the Tongass National Forest. This eye-opening journey spawned the creation of our mythopoetic film, When Old Growth Ends, an offering to the sacred constellation of salmon, old-growth trees, and original stewards of the Tongass, the Clinket, Haida, and Shimshian peoples. Upon returning home, I felt so proud of the film that we had created together. But my intuition knew this wasn't enough. I knew I had to go back and tend my relationships with the people and the land that I had started, and be a witness to their stories. Over the past few years, I have continued to travel back, with a few new stops along the way, to deepen my relationships, old and new, with the bears, with the local people, with the waters, and with the glaciers. The In the Field episodes that we'll be sharing over the coming months and into the future are a reflection of these complex and winding relationships, featuring organizers, land defenders, and voices fighting on the ground. Sharing these intimate conversations that took place in person, over breakfasts, long walks, and adventures on the river, is a reminder that nurturing connection and showing up with integrity in the little moments are how we will remake each other and the world. In the Field is about asking questions, listening, and holding each other in the darkness and lightness of our earthly experiences. We humbly offer ourselves and this platform to those fighting for land and life, whose honest testimony of place we so desperately need to navigate the ever-shifting Anthropocene. This week and next, we bring you episodes from the Tongass, the still-beating heart of the temperate rainforest that once blanketed the coastlines from Northern California up through Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, and Alaska. We share the stories of our dear allies, two Clinket women, Wanda Kashudaha Kulp and Kasaya Gay, as the Trump administration and U.S. Forest Service moved to rescind a policy called Roadless Rule that would reopen 9.2 million acres of protected land back up to logging and resource extraction. 
We hope their stories make the forest come alive for you, as they have for me, and move you to stand up for one of the most precious living libraries left on this earth. Please visit our website at forthewild.world to make a public comment today and add your voice to keep roadless rule protections in place. Now let's begin. Early in the morning Baby, that's when I rise Early in the morning Long before I see your eyes Got no time for coffee Today we visit Wanda Kashudaha Kulp. Wanda is a Tlingit woman from the village of Huna in southeast Alaska that sits within the Tongass rainforest. In Wanda's words, she is a professional paper pusher and artist by trade, a hunter, fisherwoman, and gatherer of wild foods. She is a fierce and longtime forest defender and the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network coordinator for the Tongass National Forest. It feels right to begin with Wanda, as she was one of the people I spoke with during my first trip up to Prince of Wales with the crew of When Old Growth Ends. We were joined by Emily Aramison and Osprey Oriel Lake, the founder and executive director of the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network, whose voice you'll hear in the recordings. When I think back to this time, I remember feeling really nervous about this interview. It's one thing to travel with a group of friends and make a film, but it's another to be mirrored by someone like Wanda, who is of the land. It was so clear to me that this wasn't about us, and it wasn't about our journey, but something much larger that was asking us to listen in a new way, show up with intention, and for many of us, wrestle with how to be good allies, especially to indigenous communities. Before the interview, my dear friends Miriam, Mila, and Bryn walked down to the docks in search of local salmon, and the incredible kitchen witches they are cooked a big feast for Wanda and her friends. I remember seeing this huge platter with the most beautiful pink salmon adorned with berries and ferns and other forest plants. Over the next few days, we gave gifts to one another, hiked in the forest, picked berries, and walked the clear cuts. Altogether, sweet and heartbreaking, the time we spent with Wanda was such a gift. She challenged me and opened my eyes to the wider picture of ongoing extraction in southeast Alaska beyond the story of old growth logging. Filled with such fiery passion and an indomitable warrior spirit, as you'll hear, Wanda's words are ones that I return to again and again for guidance in this time. This is where national interest needs mm -hmm. to be blown up and magnified, and every American person who walks the street needs to know, this is your land, America. Say something about it. Mm -hmm. Feel protective towards it. Because this is a rainforest. This is a living organism, the whole thing. And nobody sees it that way. Yeah. So we're coming very humbly to you and to the people of the land here to learn from you, to hear your story, and you know this this intersection between you know caring for the forest, uplifting indigenous voices, uh, what it is that you see, your vision for your territories, and how can we support that. We are just newcomers coming from all different intersections of life, but with a common desire that we want to protect life and we want to protect these lands that hold so much knowledge that we can't even begin to understand. Yes. It's been the women picking up the battle and being so verbose, more women than the men, because of the same thing. All of the wildlife that lives around us has families. And we understand about families. And home 
a safe home for the future. Every living thing needs that. Our elders say, for instance, we love seal meat, we love seal, and we go after and hunt them. We understand them. They'll say, if you understand the family life of a seal, you will understand the family life of a trinket. As the first people in this country, when it was way a different environment and a different world, we learned from the wildlife. As we grew in numbers, we broke into two different halves, eagles and the ravens. I'm an eagle, and each of our families on the eagle or raven side has subfamilies that people call clans. And I don't like to use clans because it takes the face of a family away because that's what we are, families. Mm -hmm. We relate to all living things that way. We believe that every living thing has a soul and is alive. The air, the water, the glaciers, the mountains, everything has mm -hmm. a soul and a story. That's how we learn. Our history is older than Christ. They're trying to say that our way of life is old and a thing of the past. Then that means that every living thing is old and a thing of the past. And that is the brain that's stepping on us right now. If you can't relate to what you're destroying, then you're doing it thoughtlessly and with no heart. And that's what's happening now. That is the disrespect for living. Before land claims, we were Plunkets, Haidas, Simpsians, Inuit all of us, indigenous people of Alaska, used and occupied all of Alaska. Russia never owned any part of us. They mm -hmm. had contact with Yakutat, got beat out of there, and ended up in Sitka. And they had trading rights. That's it. They didn't come inside waters around us because we would award them. We've never been defeated. Then Alaska becomes part of the United States. 1867, the first 12 years, we were under martial law. So that mentality has stuck to this day. And following martial law, it was decided that we need to be civilized. So they brought the marshals, the preachers, and the teachers. That is when we became illegal in our own midst. That's when we became unemployed. That's when we became undereducated. That's when every impact of our life is started. And they were telling us that we were old-fashioned, we were punished severely for being who they are, speaking trinket. I heard just the other day of one of our elders who's passed now, she was in a, um, they put us in schools, right? And punished us for speaking our language. And this one gal from Huna, Tuffy, she'd speak trinket and they'd beat her, and she'd stand up and do it again. They'd beat her, and she'd stand up and do it again. And that's what she did. Consequently, the ones that were telling me they're older, and they speak the language, Tlingit language, and I don't, but they said that's why we speak it, because mm. she did that. And it took that kind of courage, and that's the kind of courage it takes any time to speak out when the masses are against you. When Alaska had to be populated, and we, under the treaties from Russia, and then even the state of Alaska constitution says that we're not to be disturbed. But oh, have we ever been disturbed? It's never been held sacred that we be allowed to be who we are. Because uh, right off the bat, they did to us what they did to the ones down south, and that's making them feel like not human beings trying to mold them into being white and it's not working. We cannot begin to understand the battles over land and water unfolding in the Tongass today until we peel back the layers of time to unearth all that has been stolen from the indigenous peoples of so-called Alaska. As Wanda shares, the state has tried to sever the web of life-sustaining relations and sacred bonds within the Tongass since the first point of contact. They have tried to extinguish the powerful spirit of people in place, criminalizing indigenous lifeways that did not fit in with the state's paradigm of whiteness 
and capitalistic productivity. This violation, what began with early colonial and missionary settlements, Alaska's annexation by the U.S., martial law, and boarding schools, continued on into the mid-20th century through land claims, disputes between the tribes and the state over land ownership, and resource use in the Tongass. So our battle for land claims was, we want to live in our midst, hunt, fish, gather, mm. prepare for the future, and continue our lifestyle. Well, everybody politically is saying that we're backwards, we've got to come into the modern world. Well, our culture is so strong and beautiful, and it is being exploited. Everybody loves us. Tourists want to see us, but we're the poorest people in Alaska. Land claims, the dirty rotten trick that Congress did to us because um, Alaska Natives were able in 1950s and 60s to stop the big oil barons from coming into Alaska to start drilling because our land claims was growing and growing. The Secretary of Interior, Udall, at the time, put a land freeze on all of the mm -hmm. um, advancement of the oil companies, you know, and you can imagine how that upset them. You don't tell them no, right? Well, we did. So land claims, Congress had to face land claims, and once they did, we understand now how it works. Lobbyists, mm -hmm. they run Congress. Every one of those guys are bought and paid for. And so land claims, to me, turns out to be nothing but the revenge of the oil and gas companies because land claims has turned on us. All of Alaska is ours. We're people of the land, people of the sea, people of the forest, and yet we are eliminated. Well, the Forest Service, get this, this is national interest land. This is where I come from when I'm saying, this is your land. National interest belongs to everybody here, not to us. For decades, the indigenous peoples across Alaska had been fighting for their rights to their ancestral homelands. Congress, however, dragged its feet on reparations with tribes until it was clear that territory disputes were holding up the construction of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. Federal and state governments, oil companies, conservationists, and the Alaska Federation of Natives eventually came to a compromise. And shortly thereafter, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act commonly known as ANCSA, was signed into law in 1971 by Richard Nixon. ANCSA extinguished Aboriginal title to the land in exchange for 44 million acres, 11% of Alaska Natives' original land base, as well as $962.5 million in compensation. These assets, however, were not given directly to the people, but to newly formed Native corporations imposing a rigid, capitalist structure over diverse tribes and cultures, ANCSA carved out 12 regional corporations and nearly 200 village corporations that remain in control of the land and resources. Headquartered in Juneau, Sea Alaska is the largest regional corporation and Huna Totem is the village corporation in Wanda's community. What they said was that none of our rights would be taken from us without our knowledge. Well, that didn't happen with ANSCA because they had a person from here and maybe somebody else from way over there and way over there and way over there. They called themselves Alaska Federation of Natives. And those were the ones that um, Congress and the president used to sanction ANSCA. None of us knew what was going on. Not only did they put lands in corporations, but they gave it to the state of Alaska. State of Alaska, all of our native lands is under the state of Alaska. Half of the recognized American Indian tribes are in Alaska. Alaska does not recognize tribes or tribal members. So therefore, they made us corporations and shareholders rather than brothers and sisters and family. They made us business people. We already had our business before any Americans came by us. We had our fishing business, we had, you know, our hunting, we bartering, we bartered with each other. What, this one don't have, this one will. 
Same thing on um, Chichikov Island or any of the islands. You know, we traveled and bartered inside passage here. This is uh, canoe passage. That's our trade route. And we utilized everything. Because we didn't wipe it out or make a mess, the federal government said we weren't using and occupying huge parts mm -hmm. of our land. And then by early 80s is when the logging started. So Sea Alaska started forming in the 70s, and the ones that helped form it that were traditional thinkers got fired, and others moved in. I'll say this here. Because of the stigma of being indigenous person before ANSCA, it was a lot of shame and a lot of um, grief. Mm. So there was a lot of us that didn't claim blood. And so as soon as ANSCA mm. came on, um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs came around to our houses and did what they called enrollment. We got enrolled. We each got our BIA numbers. We're the only people in America with numbers, by the way, um, American Indians. So the ones that they didn't know who were Native were invited to come to the Alaska Native Brotherhood Hall and sign up for ANSCA and become shareholders. Non-Native. They were the ones that oh. were claiming to be non-Native. Mm -hmm. And once money and land came in, it's like, woof, out of the woodwork came all these people. Yeah. And I can remember my mom and her buddies were all lined up, you know, to yeah. become enrolled. <laughs> Suddenly. <laughs> Those are the ones that are running the corporations now. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. So then the ones in the villages, we remain, as it's called, tribal thinkers. So we've got tribal thinkers and corporate thinkers now. Down south, you've got reservation and non-reservation. You see what they've done to us? Split and conquer, it works like a charm. So the corporations, Alaska Native corporations, are not operating out of the villages. So we've got 12 regional corporations, and for Southeast Alaska, that's Sea Alaska. And then within each village, we have village corporations. In Juneau, there are five village corporations plus Sea Alaska. They're not in the villages creating the jobs. They're in Juneau looking down on us in the village saying, oh, your job will be to clean the toilets or for logging you'll be doing the hard stuff that'll get you killed. They put our people in the most dangerous or the menial jobs. We're not in charge of ourselves. We aren't saying, here's a project coming your way. Put it into the village and you get your people together, your experts, and, and you operate it and then put everybody to work. That's not happening from the inside out. It's happening from the outside in, and people who have never been stepped foot in the beautiful place like this are the ones that are saying, chop it down, get rid of it. Let's make some money because my bank book needs it. I want a nice big house. I want everything. I want the American dream. So what's our dream look like? You know, what is the American dream for us? We have a right to that American dream in our vision, not in a stamped position like the colonial people say, this is how you live. You go to church, you go to school, you do this, you do that throughout life. And what does it mean though? What does it mean? There is so much more to life than, than these things. The education that we need living off of the land is right here on the water, on the land. This is where our education is the most effective.
from the outset, Congress sold ANCSA as an experiment in economic stimulation and promised the corporation's profits and wealth would be shared with affected communities. But as Wanda relates, this couldn't be further from the truth. In reality, ANCSA set the stage for corporate development and rampant resource extraction in mining, timber, and tourism, forcing members of tribes to become shareholders. The divisive corporate structure of ANCSA has also deeply fractured Wanda's community, eroded indigenous sovereignty, and taken away people's ability to represent their own interests. The law also contains loopholes that allow non-natives to acquire shares and limit the ways shares could be passed down, threatening future generations' rights to their land. So you see how there's no protection under this um, corporate structure, none for us. It's designed to make our communities faceless. It's designed to take our tongues away. As long as these corporate heads that you meet go to our National Indian Education Conferences or to our National Congress of American Indian Conferences and represent us, that is wrong. We have to even mm -hmm. educate the national organizations that, no, you don't let corporate people come into from Alaska and say they're speaking for the villages and the tribes. They are not. We don't have a group that represents our voice, our face, our feelings. I wanted to bring their propaganda forward because it's what it is, the Sea Alaska newsletter yeah. right here. When they blend it with the Tlingit language, it's so deceiving. Ha'ani literally means yeah. our land. They shouldn't be messing like that because it's to their advantage to make it look like they're working with us when they're not. They changed their Sea Alaska timber operation to Ha'ani. So do you see how it just vagues out their purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, and here it says that Sea Alaska provides 600 jobs in their logging. You know, they make it sound like it's us that have these jobs. So who are these jobs for? I'll tell you who it's for. It's for the logging industry's people. Because each industry that comes in around us has their own people. And we get to be the bottom of the stick or the who end of the stick. We're the service end. Every one of us know how to wash dishes and clean up pooper. So we don't need training, right? We're just so valuable. And the corporation has made sure all of our small business has been eliminated in the last 13 years. Mm. So we, oh, I just won't even go into it. Yeah. But um, now we so have to faith. start from ground zero and say, we want our community building back from that corporation, and we're going to fight for it. Then the next step, we want our tribal council back. We want it, so we're going to fight for it. Next thing. The Sea Alaska and Huna Totem corporations are going to have to learn to listen to us, and they're not going to, because the state of Alaska is going to make sure they don't, and they coexist off of each other. We need to be running our show, not a bunch of others that don't know it. And as long as we don't understand the corporate structure, as long as the classrooms and the state of Alaska education system is not teaching us about what corporations are all about and shareholders, we're going to be floundering forever. And it's not right because now we have little kids coming up that don't know anything. And it's by design. I tell people, you, our own people, you turn around, you look at all the land around us. That's our land. Do you hear what I'm saying? This is our land. And how are we being treated? The worst. We're the ones that are looked at with suspicion. Our way of life is under attack. And yet, all this is our land. Sitting across from Wanda as she spoke about the divisiveness and toxicity that Anxa has seeded within her community was shocking and heartbreaking. I remember her speaking with such an intelligent, nuanced understanding of these convoluted laws and legal jargon that, in all honesty, I hadn't known that much about but for her was a necessity to survive under this kind of corporate and state violence. What I thought was a story about the U.S. Forest Service and old growth logging quickly came into greater clarity in its hulking, monstrous form. A complex, corporate, colonial, capitalistic machine that is draining the sacred and feeding from the bodies of the lands, rivers, winds, and glaciers. Wanda's words connected the dots for me between these interconnected violences, from the clear cuts 
to the decline of salmon, to missing and murdered indigenous people. I also felt the urgency and sacred rage with which Wanda charted a map of her life story deep within my bones. To not only live within a system that's trying to steal your land and spirit, but to be silenced within this experience. To have the clinket linguistic and artistic forms inscribed on the letterhead of corporate capitalism is so sickeningly cruel. While exposing these violences, Wanda, in her fiery, spirited form, also unearthed the vast wealth and beauty of this place and the unrelenting determination of her people. While others have an agenda to take, to produce, to extract, Wanda's has been to give back to the forest, to honor the traditional ways of her people, and to protect the great beings of this land. When the last of the sun meets the Of the law that's bond from Anston is called ANILCA, Alaska National Interest Conservation Act. And that's where all the federal lands belong to everybody under ANILCA. Title VIII is the one that applies to us. And that is supposed to be the protection of Alaska Native people to hunt, fish, gather as they did in the past, for the future, and present. However, the Forest Service doesn't know how to administer it, so therefore it's not happening. We could really tackle that one. Utilizing local people, how hard is that? I'm not talking the politicians, I'm talking the real people who hunt, fish, gather, and live off the land. Because the Forest Service is clueless. We're the ones not at the table. In 1980, Congress passed ANILCA the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act, with the stated intention of conserving Alaska's natural heritage and protecting native rights to hunt and fish. The federal law, however, also granted equal subsistence rights to both native and non-native residents living in rural regions. This and a string of subsistence regulations determined by the government have undermined and criminalized people's traditional ways of harvesting food from the land as they have done for thousands of years. While Anilka offers the possibility of protections for Alaska Natives, Wanda speaks to a much fuller picture of subsistence and how this regulatory framework impacts her community's ability to feel nourished and connected with wild foods. To move towards greater food sovereignty, we must ask the important question of access. Like who is really being prioritized within this system? So what that does it made anyone who moves into this village can subsist. They can go out and set 30 hooks for halibut subsist for subsistence. We had to fight tooth and nail to get that law to happen. In Huna, we have people that moved in, immigrants that moved in and brag loudly about, oh yeah, I sent a thousand pounds of halibut down to my family down south. That's $4,000 worth of fish. That is illegal. Here's an example with uh, how the state troopers work and the likes of Sea Alaska Corporation. We have Sea Alaska land in Huna, and these two um, hunters, brothers, were out in their skiff, and the tide's running, the wind is blowing, so you got to keep the engine going so that you could at least be stable. And then they saw a deer on Sea Alaska land and shot it. There was a fake deer on Sea Alaska land. 
and there happened to be a city cop and a state trooper friends out of the uniform in a private skiff, saw it happen. They got to Huna, waited for him at the dock, and it took him to court, took the firearms. And they got cited and prosecuted because the engine was supposed to be off, said the state of Alaska. So they confiscate any wildlife and take our means to uh, hunt as well. State troopers and the cops and the Forest Service and the Park Service and the Coast Guard will bother us. But nobody else that comes in to hunt, fish, and gather, they have a free-for-all. Stand at the airport. You can't even begin to count those big boxes of our seafood heading out. And we in the villages don't have our share. We're hungry. Our smokehouses are empty. You know, we should, we should have every smokehouse going right now. We should be busier than heck putting up food, fish, and yet we're waiting for saners to come in and give us what they can. I got one salmon so far this year. Wanda isn't alone. As fisher folk all over southeast Alaska are struggling amid declining salmon populations, a pattern that has repeated across every other wild salmon fishery on Earth due to human activities, including the logging of their spawning grounds. The only winners in the wake of a clear cut are the berries that take advantage of the sunshine for a spell before being shaded out. A few days after our interview with Wanda, we went berry picking with Wanda and her friend Becky. We drove for miles and miles on these dirt roads and then walked into an area that had been completely slashed by logging, with berry bushes coming up through the rubble of conquest of the forest. I laugh thinking about this now, but I remember being surprised by how hard we were physically working and how protective Becky seemed to be over these big bowls of berries. It didn't align with my perhaps romanticized vision of carefree, fun fruit picking. But then I realized that these berries are important. They are sacred. They are culture. And they are the nourishment that Becky would be living off of in the winter months. After, we went back to Becky's house, where she showed us her incredible cedar weavings. And as we said goodbye, she gave each of us three ball jars of jam, honey, and salmon. I just couldn't believe the fluidity and openness of her generosity. Inviting ten women she had just met into her space, and then showering us with such delicious abundance from her forest. I think of Becky and Wanda every time I pick berries from Cougar Mountain and share the harvest with my friends. Such a beautiful, primordial act of nurturance that creates strong bonds among and between people and the land. I have while looking at this map and seeing the different designations you know we have tribal private land we have wilderness we have national forest we have state land and when I brought up wilderness you had a reaction to did that. I hiss <laughs> there, yeah there was a hiss and I, I want to dive into that with you okay my people are from Glacier Bay and that is run by the National Park Service federal another federal agency, we've got federal around us. So they were part of the Forest Service at one time. I, I'm always feeling like I'm looking at Glacier Bay, but the park moved in and started growing, claiming more and more, and the Forest Service would relinquish more and more acres to them. And the Park Service in 1996 developed federal regulations that literally say that Tlingit people are banned from Glacier Bay. 
thanks to a conservation group, fishing conservation group, and who came under Lud 2, that's where I heard it first. Lud 2 is wilderness land. Under wilderness land, you can't take motorized vehicles in, you can't do this, you can't do that. It's so special for anyone who wants to go in on a kayak. But, by the way, any canoes, you stay on land for tourists to look at, not for us to use. There's kayaks in Glacier Bay. Kayaks belong up north. We're canoe people. And when Anilka came out, it expanded Glacier Bay, made it bigger. And that's our sacred homeland. None of these boundaries were ours. We only had our boundaries from one village area. This is um, Prince of Wales. You know, that's not Plinket land. You know, when we understand that. We would never come in when we were traveling by water and stuff, we would ask permission to come ashore. We wouldn't just come ashore. That's respect. Mm -hmm. That's saying we know we're guests. We wouldn't go anywhere and get into their streams because that would be um, act of war. It'd be like someone yeah. coming into your very own house and, and start helping themselves to your cupboards. Our elders, all deceased, wrote a resolution 1991, when 16 different interest groups for Glacier Bay came into Huna. The Huna people, elders, took over the meeting for the first six hours. Oh, was there some pissed off faces. We sang a very sacred song that we never sing in public to show every one of those people there that this is our home. This is our home. All of you folks with your big knife to take your slice of our land, you know that we were here first. Probably two-thirds to three-quarters of the people there were in awe of what was presented by our elders. And there was some that looked at us with pure hate. When the Park Service banned us out of Glacier Bay in 1996, they doubled the amount of humongous cruise line ships allowed into pristine waters. The same law. That is how underhanded they are, and that's how we're treated. So in terms of a cultural conservation and land conservation... There's no cultural conservation. Is there a plan that could work as both, that could allow you to be on your... Co-management. Co-management, and what does that look like? I would say if the federal government, first, next we work on them, but federal government needs to work with us at a table, face-to-face, and allow the Alaska Native villages to co-manage Anilka Title VIII, for instance. And they step out of it and then let us come up with a plan, get our heads together, our heads without interruption, and see what we can come up with because I know there's some good ideas out there. And then we could present it and with the mandate that we come out with a co-management plan that works for for both sides. And how do you see that working for old growth logging? How would, how would you see a co-management of what's left of the old growth in the Tongass? That would be a perfect start because that's where our culture started was old growth. And we grew up with the old growth. We knew it before it was old growth. We knew our lands when it was covered with ice. We knew our lands when it was lush green valley. I mean, our culture is so ancient and so old. For it to be so treated like it's a thing of the past is so wrong. Our culture is as old as China. So the attitudes of the lawmakers have to change. They've got to look at us as human beings, not as animals. The more I've learned from Wanda about the dark histories of conservation, national parks, the logging industry, ANCSA, and subsistence laws, the more thorny and complex these issues seem. What is clear from Wanda's testimony, however, is that these outside colonial forces and corporate structures have decimated her people's ability to fluidly move, migrate, eat, breathe, and live as they once did on the land and waters of the Tongass. Over the past few years, I have clung to the memory of Wanda coming alive in the forest delighting in birdsong, plant medicine, and the call of her ancestors. To be in the presence of someone 
with such a deep connection and knowing of this place was beyond magical. Rolling sound. <clears throat> All right. That? <laughs> okay. Is that far Just enough? Just hair to your right. That's great. Rolling. As we stand here, right in the middle of the forest, the old growth, this is so perfect because you could look around and see all of the life that we have here, life on life on life. There's a word in the Tlingit language called Kayani. It means plants from the top of the mountain to the beach, low tide. We also see when the tide is out, the table is set. There's so much food out there. But inside here, medicinal plants, food, everything that the forest provides us is nutrition and makes us healthier and stronger. Even the sap coming out of the trees is medicine for us. Our people have walked all over our country. Our hunters know the trails. They use the bear trails, the deer trails to get to the top of the mountains. And our doctors, our women doctors, used to go and hole up in the mountains to learn everything they can. I heard that there's a plant that grows a really beautiful flower that grows right outside of a bear den. And it grows because of the heat coming out of the den. And that it was used as a love potion. So this is how strong we are connected. We know what the plants do. At one time we knew what every one of them did. And when our people pass, when they die, we believe and we will say they walked into the forest. When someone is told that, we don't have to ask if they died. We know they did. So this is another layer of importance to us on why the forest is so valuable because it holds the spirits of our ancestors and this is what we need. Every time they tear down some forest we hurt because they're bothering our spiritual ancestors as well as all the life within. It holds life and death for all of us and we live well within it. Thousands of old growth giants have been ruthlessly logged in the Tongass in recent decades. In the 1980s and 90s in particular, Sea Alaska and the Forestry Service's timber operations clear cut traditional hunting grounds around Huna, devastating wildlife habitat and water quality. Folks like Wanda have fought long and hard to speak out against the corporate rule that has descended on their home. In 2001, roadless rule was passed prohibiting further road construction and timber harvest in inventoried roadless areas. But the fight still continues. The blood on this land is ours, ours throughout time and history. The water is ours. We've lost lots of people in the water. When the trees start going down, we hurt, we cried. We're, we're the land. We eat off the land. And like, I've been dealing with Devil Club so long, it doesn't bother me. Nettles either, because I have the medicine in me, I drink it and use it all the time. So that's, I say that because that's a demonstration of how much we are part of the land. If you are what you eat, we are deer, we are everything we eat, we're salmon. We're cockles and clams and beach asparagus and berries. We're everything. We're all part of it. And the birds and animals around us know us and we know them. There's crows that watch me because I help save a baby crow. And they follow me even. Mm -hmm. There's ravens that follow us and tell on us and you know. <laughs> We're so part of it, we're so aware of each other, that we know each other. We know the birds, we know the deer. We don't want to love them too much because that'll make it too hard to shoot them. Mm -hmm. We have to come to terms with that. And in that process, we have to express our gratitude 
for them for giving themselves to us and feeding us. Same thing with the plant. You know, I've seen people be grateful to the water. Thank you for bringing us this food. The fish. We don't just take without thinking about it. We don't just eat something without realizing the value of it and what it's doing for us. Especially if we're related to it. We're related to the salmon. My opposite ravens are cohos, my favorite fish. <laughs> Once we're allowed to be who we are, it's a whole different story. It's hard to describe the feeling of vastness that washes over me in the Tongass. A place where it feels like the land's limbs can grow autonomously. There's so much that's just endless forest and creature and water and sky. There's thick moss and ripe berries, lichens hanging down, varied topography, oceanscapes, cresting waves, islands and fish jumping. So many thousands of hidden nooks and bays, glaciers and rushing rivers. This place has set my heart on fire. It's phenomenal. And it's also drastically changing. Returning for the past few years, I've seen glaciers dissolve in front of my very eyes. I've sat amongst the deafening silence of the clear cuts where tree corpses and shattered splinters litter the ground. Witnessed where waters have been strangled and tar black roads suffocated the lands. It's happened, it's happening, and it will continue to happen. Since my conversation with Wanda, Allied powers within the Trump administration, U.S. Forest Service, and Alaska Congress have moved forward with their agenda to rescind roadless rule and quietly reopen more than half of the Tongass back up to logging and resource extraction. For indigenous peoples whose lineages trace the contours of this land, for a shrinking future of clean water and air, for the return of salmon, for a world darkened by the shadow of climate chaos. For all of us, we cannot afford to lose this magnificent mother of primordial life. This is where national interest needs to be blown up and magnified, and every American person who walks the street needs to know, this is your land, America. Say something about it. Feel protective towards it. Because this is a rainforest. This is a living organism, the whole thing, and nobody sees it that way. It comes as quickly as it goes. I wonder why it ever came at all. Will it teach you? Can it reach you? Does it need to? Speak no evil, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, see no evil. Last summer, I called up Wanda to check in about the roadless rule and the most recent developments on the ground. This is what she shared with me. Hello. Hey, Wanda. It's Ayana from For the Wild. Hi. Hi. How, How are you doing? You? It's very frustrating that we're going around on this again. The last century, when the clear cutting was just so blatant in the 80s and 90s around our villages in southeast Alaska, it was horrifying. We had no clue of the plans. No one told us anything. So when the chainsaw started, we did see the equipment coming in. But the first time around, the equipment coming in was very rusted and old. And already the company that was brought in and contracted by the uh, village corporation, it was already dying back in the 80s and 90s. So what's happening now is trying to you know, kick a dead dog, so to speak. There is no profit in timber anymore. There isn't. And 
even though the interests of such business is affects all the way to the, our top dogs, it just shows and proves to us that the industry controls our Congress and that there are, are Congress people that are screaming the loudest and trying to, you know, revive a dead dog are the ones that whose family must be making money off of this because it's certainly not because it's been beneficial to the American people. It's always been industry that's controlling this. And until the government becomes the government of the people, this is the way it's going to be. Even though there's a majority of people speaking up, the government is not responding to the people. It's responding more to the industry because that's where the money is. Everything is about money. It does not even matter that logging is a losing project for everybody, but who? Um, in a video that documents the journey to Washington, you spoke to what is at the heart of all of this when you said, quote, our voices have to be as important as industries, if not more important, because industries come in, but we live there and we have to live with the impacts, end quote. And I'd like to ask how we can support this rising that you're helping to midwife in the thick of this fight. Highlighting the living cultures is huge and that is what you folks can be doing is recognizing that globally thousands of cultures have disappeared as well as endangered i mean animals and wildlife our cultural existence is equally endangered highlighting the magnificent intelligence of our cultures is what is going to save this earth. And globally, women are speaking out. And globally, there are no arguments against what we're saying. We're not talking with each other, and yet we're all saying the same thing. Our culture is based on the, on the love of the land, the understanding of Mother Nature, and our spiritual connections. We have them, and they're intact yet. To lose the cultures of the world and become just industry would make for an ugly world. And we will lose this world, lose it. We won't have any beauty. We won't have any fresh air and water. Those ones that are in charge of industry and the, all those executives, they can't buy fresh air, clean water. Oh my gosh, when we we're flying into D.C., I could literally see the polluted air that we were flying into is going to have to breathe those days we were there. That wasn't a good feeling. I also noticed that water wasn't the color of water. Is that what they want for Alaska? That is not what we want. That's not what we need. Alaska is too beautiful and too magnificent to ruin. Literally a treasure for the United States that we cannot be abusing and allowed to be exploited it's time for everyone to stand up and literally take action and do force the change around to the attack on, on nature, on, on these big shots that are saying so blasé, this is what we're going to do. We're going to weaken this law. We're going to ignore these environmental laws. We're going to just make sure none of this ever happened. Well, it took a lot for each law to occur. It didn't just happen overnight. And for them to just blase act like they have the power to change that, that's not going to happen overnight either. So we got a battle on our hands and we're not going to lose. We cannot afford it. We hear Wanda's rallying cry for the Tongass and envision a collective uprising to protect this great northern forest. Equipped with immutable hearts and strategic minds, we must move together separating and rejoining like a braided river, constantly revising our course, strengthening relationships with indigenous leaders like Wanda, with long-standing activists in the region, with each other, and the communities of the forest and sea. The most immediate action step you can take at this time to defend the Tongass is to submit a thoughtful public comment to the Forest Service. As U.S. citizens, it's our responsibility to engage in public process however futile it may seem at times. Active participation in this way is really the very least we can do to show up 
and support people on the front lines who will be most impacted by this high stakes public lands decision. Beyond that, we need to courageously expand the existing envelope of action in order to win. We need a panoply of resistance from the established tactics like public comments, advocacy and demonstrations, blockades and encampments, to even more creative gestures of resistance and daring acts of land defense. The time is now to take risks, to unlock the autonomy of our minds and our bodies, and to step into a biocentric allegiance to the descendants of all species. We also ask that you support indigenous stewards of the Tongass by making a direct donation to Wanda Culp or to the local organization Huna Alaska Native Sisterhood Camp 12, which you can also find under this episode on our website. The importance of investing in female indigenous leadership and those giving voice to the forest cannot be overstated. Lastly, please follow and reach out to longstanding groups in the region, such as Sitka Conservation Society, Southeast Alaska Conservation Council, Last Dance, Lynn Canal Conservation, Audubon, Alaska, and Earth Justice. We ask that you consider, what can you offer of your resources, your gifts, your spirit, and your brilliance in this moment of unraveling and becoming? Baby, that's when I rise Early in the morning Long before I see your eyes Got no time for coffee Now I gotta run Early in the morning Another life is done When I rise When I rise When I rise Baby, when I rise Dive deeper into the listening journey with more interviews from our In the Field series. We'll be posting behind-the-scenes cuts in the days and weeks to come on our website, Tune in at forthewild.world slash when old growth ends. And join us next week for the second episode of In the Field as we pick up the conversation with Wanda's longtime friend and partner in justice, Kasaya Gay. Thank you for listening to For the Wild podcast, In the Field edition. I'm Ayana Young. The music you heard today was the Crow Nation blues man, Carrie Morin, Leah Thomas, Rising Appalachia, Hannah Shin, and our very own Carter Lou McElroy, and the Clinkett citizens of Huna, Alaska. I would like to give a huge bow of gratitude to our incredible podcast production team, Aidan McRae, Carter Lou McElroy, Erica Ekram, Aaron Wise, Francesca Glassbell, Hannah Wilton, March Young, Melanie Younger, and Vera Lummy. I'd like to take a moment and also thank the crew of When Old Growth Ends, Bryn McKay, Eve Bradford, Hannah Germstad, Jade Begay, Kailaya Frederick, Koa Kalish, Mila Prince, Miriam Grace, and Leslie Satterfield. Baby, that's when I rise Oh, they come for me Baby, I gotta run Guess I don't